Hi everybody, I hope you're well. Uh, today I will read from a book titled Extinct, uh, a Compendium of Obsolete Objects, edited by Barbara Penner, Adrian Forti, Olivia Turner, and Miranda Critchley, and published by Reaction Books. This book is a collection of objects that once populated the world, but do so no longer. Some of the artifacts and technology it contains were once ubiquitous. Others barely made it into existence, not much more than an idea or a prototype. We are interested not simply in why these things disappeared, but in what their disappearance tell us about the world we have created for ourselves. The process of the disappearance of objects and technology is sometimes referred to as obsolescence and sometimes extinction. Both terms contain certain assumptions about how and why things disappear, while neglecting other, no less pertinent, possibilities. Extinction is explicitly a borrowing from theories of natural selection and evolution, and like all analogies, makes certain things clearer while obscuring others. One particular obfuscation that arises when Darwin's idea of evolution are applied to artifacts is the assumption that it is only the fittest, the best or the most appropriate objects and technology that survive. In this model, design, like nature, is thought to be an optimization machine, always pushing forward, progressing towards perfection. When things disappear, they do so, it is implied, because of their own inadequacy or their unsuitedness uh, to their conditions. Part of the purpose of this book is to probe and question this seeming inevitability. Its other purpose is to use extinct objects to recall other ways and possibilities of engaging with the world. Why are extinct objects suited for this task? We suggest that, at the moment of their invention, technology and products must all project forward in some way. The act of design and manufacturing is anticipatory. To be conceived of and made, a thing is necessarily imprinted with an idea of future needs, demands and ways of living which it may then help to bring about. This projected vision of the future may not be heroic or utopian. Indeed, it is more often mundane and humble, but the result is that even the most insignificant design's extinction speaks of a road not taken, a future rerouted or unrealized. As we will discover through the 85 examples gathered in this book, there are countless practical explanations for and reasons why things become extinct. But, in considering their purpose and rationale, we encounter the ghosts of futures that never came to pass, their projections having proved unfounded, short-lived, misguided, or all too prescient of the worst of what was to come. Extinct though they may be, these objects retain the imprint of possible futures, some of which we may be glad to have left behind, and others whose relevance is recovered today. We believe that a study of extinct objects has much to offer here and now. Narratives of technology tend to be innovation-focused and do not pay much attention to cast-offs or dead-ends. They emphasize novelty and vision and are infused with a sense of destiny. But this book argues that the history of objects becomes far richer when we also consider the underside of progress. The conflicts, obsolescence, accidents, destruction and failures that are an integral part of modernization. Considering these can open up fresh perspectives on modernization's modes of operation, which is our particular concern. Darwin's On the Origin of Species was published in 1859, eight years after the Great Exhibition in London. More than any other single event, the Great Exhibition serves as an index to the material transformations that accompanied industrialization, the shift to factory production and the harnessing of new power sources. Not only did the exhibition showcase the technological advances and woods of the previous two decades, but it also presaged the developments to come, 
most memorably through the Crystal Palace own construction, a revolutionary demonstration of the potential of iron, glass and prefabrication. Many of the contradictions and paradoxes of industrial capitalism were fully on display at the Great Exhibition as well. With its list of international exhibitors, it promoted a liberal ideology of free trade and open markets. Yet, with its strong colonial presence, it signaled its dependence on commodities, captive markets and cheap labor. From the start, it was obvious that the fruits of prosperity at the Great Exhibition would never be equally distributed. And for those who cared to see it, the terrible human and environmental cost of the new methods of manufacture and urbanization were already evident, if not in the palace itself than in the streets of London. In light of these contradictions, we begin to understand that evolutionary theory and narratives of progress had a crucial role to play in modernization. They were required to naturalize the impact of capitalism and to ensure its continued spread. This was certainly the view of the cultural historian Lewis Manford, who, in his monumental Tectonic and Civilization, 1934, argued that the function of evolutionary theory in industrial society was not to explain technical change, but to normalize the inequities produced by capitalism. In the Darwinian model, the enrichment of the bourgeoisie became proof of their strength and their right to exploit the labor of those supposedly weaker than themselves. Observing that the phrase the survival of the fittest was a tautology, Manford notes sardonically that did not decrease its usefulness. But, for the most part, narratives of progress were able to sweep such concerns aside. Against what Manford called tooth and claw accounts of Victorian social order, a more benign account of capitalism emerged that held that it lifts up those places where it settles, rippling out to bring jobs and improve basic living conditions for all. In particular, technical innovations and infrastructural improvements are positioned as the mechanisms by which capitalism's benefits are delivered. As they bring about greater ease of movement and more rapid communication, so the theory goes, they help to create a better informed, more equal and less restive populace. When set against such advantages, resisting progress can easily be positioned as dangerous and perverse. We find faith in progress everywhere by the mid-19th century. In the wake of the Second World War, a flood of innovations was released, from injection-molded plastics to Polaroid cameras, which drove consumerism to new heights, spurred on by the corporate embrace of planned obsolescence, or, we might say, planned extinction, whereby one product model was deliberately phased out to encourage the purchase of another. By the mid-1960s, committed opposition to such strategies had emerged. Countercultural movements particularly rejected the loss of traditional skills, occupations and social relations, and the waste of natural resources that accompanied capitalist production. Other than refusing development entirely, designers also embraced the idea of appropriate technology and sought to create products that were less resource-hungry and more responsive to local communities. Historians of design and technology also questioned the evolutionary model. In the 1980s, Adrian Forti debunked Gideon's biological account of mechanization, stating firmly the design of manufactured woods is determined not by some internal genetic structure, but by the people and the industries that make them. Feminist scholars insisted that design histories were remiss in emphasizing the technical side of production and ignoring the responses of consumers. Historians of science and technology associated with actor network theory trace the interconnected and diffuse human and non-human actors who usher in or fail to usher in technological innovation. Most recently, the way in which social Darwinism and eugenics have shaped industrial design, architecture and urban planning has been exposed and firstly denounced by those who study race and the exclusionary nature of the built environment. But, despite the principled resistance to them, evolutionary models retain their allure in contemporary culture. 
In fact, the rise of computing, automation and artificial intelligence has only further enshrined the belief in progress and the worship of technological innovation. We live in an age of product drops and continual upgrades. One reason for the endurance of an evolutionary model may lie in the way patents are registered in the first place. The requirement that each invention cite prior art, that is, precedents from which it has drawn, reinforces the idea of innovation as a genetic chain. But, more generally, as the historian Gilles Lepore observes, narratives of continual innovation reflect the vested interests of those who tell, sell them. People who are in the business of selling predictions need to present the past as predictable, and in histories written by futurists, the machines just keep coming. In this book, we had to confront the fact that it is difficult to find things that are truly extinct. To enter the world of extinct objects is to enter the world of the undead, where few things expire completely. Many become dormant, waiting to be revived in another form or another place as circumstances change. And many leave residual traces in the form of design features, language or practices that persist after the object itself is gone. Now that we are in the age of the Anthropocene, with its emphasis on deep geological time, the concept of extinction becomes even more complex. Climate change has accelerated extinctions of all kinds, and yet we know that our traces will long endure. Extinction is not obliteration. Taken together, the case studies in these pages present a picture of changeability and contingency, and emphasize the sheer range of forces that must align for technology to succeed. Inevitably, to study extinction is to run up against limits. The constraints of cost, the lack of political will, the inherent conservatism of markets and the collective failure of imagination. But extinct objects can operate equally as containers of potential and of provocation, and arguably they are most compelling when seen in this light. Finally, many of the extinct objects here act as stores and repositories, offering alternative visions of how we might deal with problems in ways large and small, how we might still address the problems of cities, sustainably store and carry water, or even mask workplace noise. Extinct objects represent not only technology, but other ways of thinking, making and interacting with the world. Other attitudes toward the body, craft, copies, beauty, art, communications, movement, leisure, love, class, cultural identity, nature and artificial intelligence. Ultimately, every extinct object embodies a vision of the future, a vision that, even if the object itself has been superseded, is still in some way available to us. Ask for the book at your local bookstore and see you in the next video. Thanks for watching.